Hey y'all, welcome to my channel. If you've watched the last video, thank you. This is my channel called Kindred Flame, and my name's Allison. I'm just somebody who loves Jesus because I was saved, and I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see, and now I just want to shed light on things through that lens. And you've probably heard about that crazy prayer that was prayed in Congress, the most recent Congress. A man and a woman. <laughs> There's actually a lot more to that prayer than just the amen and a women part. That's just the part that the sound bite that the internet pounced on. But I want to break down that prayer some more. And I also found the very first prayer that our Congress ever opened up their first Congress meeting with. And I want to compare those two prayers to just show our nation was built on biblical principles and it's just strayed. So I'm looking forward to giving y'all that wisdom and knowledge. So let's get started. By the way, I linked both of the prayers in the description, so if you want the full prayers, just click on those links. So the circumstances surrounding the prayer at the first Congress were that, I'm just going to quote the article, it says, When the Continental Congress first met on September 5th, 1774 at Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia, there was a sober atmosphere, knowing that England, their mother country, which had the greatest army on earth, was sending troops to force them into submission. So there was a crying out to God during this prayer that everybody in the room, even though they were of different denominations, all believed in the God of Scripture and were crying out to him unanimously through this prayer. And in the testimony of this prayer, they say that every heart in the room was on fire and that they felt it was a move of God. And this is the first lines of the prayer right now. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty, King of kings and Lord of lords, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers on earth, and reignest with power supreme and uncontrolled over all kingdoms, empires, and governments. Look down, we beseech thee, on these our American states, who have fled to thee from the rod of our oppressor, thrown themselves on thy gracious protection, desiring henceforth to be dependent only on thee. So as you could see, they were pleading with God as British armies were about to arrive, so the prayer was characterized by urgency and faith and an acknowledgement of their full reliance upon the God who has declared himself in Scripture. And then I'd like to contrast that with the most recent prayer that Congress was opened with. So it was opened with prayer by a representative who was also a Methodist pastor. His name is Emmanuel Cleaver. So I'm going to play a clip of the end of the prayer, like around the last minute of the prayer, which at first claims God as who he's praying to, but then completely does a 180 and basically corrupts the entire prayer. Now may the God who created the world and everything in it bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace. Peace in our families, peace across this land. And dare I ask, O oh Lord, peace even in this chamber, now and evermore. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths. A man and a woman. I just want to start off by addressing how much is wrong with the prayer on the superficial level of logic. For example, he prays to the monotheistic God and then follows that up immediately by explaining that statement by saying Brahma and the God of many faiths or something to that end. Well, Brahma alone, you take him alone, he's the creator God with a little g of the Hindu religion, but... He's one of millions of gods, so to follow up the statement monotheistic god with Brahma is self-contradictory immediately because Brahma is one of millions of gods and they don't only worship Brahma, they worship all the gods of that religion. And um, <clears throat> this just shows the contradicting nature of a people who embrace a subjective reality. It's a slippery slope when you stop standing on scripture alone as your authority and Many in America have sought to deny that one actual truth exists 
Instead, they are preferring to say that numerous truths exist, that multiple things are true. This is called religious pluralism. However, the Bible clearly claims to be exclusive. It claims to be the word of the only true God to us as he's revealed himself. And it condemns all religions who reject that God, all other gods, and all idols. Um, so if all other religions are correct, then Christianity must be wrong. Um, however, if Christianity is true, then all other re religions must be wrong. In response to this, the left, seeking to be inclusive, has sought to affirm all religions as true, but that's a superficial affirmation because when you start getting into the nitty-gritty of what each religion believes, they all contradict each other, so it's just, it's completely contradictory and it's just a mess when you really start to unpack this false unity that they're trying to, you know, that they're trying to pull together all these different faiths. As you can see, when a people reject God, they reject his design for creation and the structures he has built. Inevitably, eventually, their basic understanding of logic begins to break down, as we have seen in our society today, which leads us to the A woman statement at the end of his prayer. A man is not a gendered term. It means so be it or I believe it to be so. So a woman is just an absurd addition. Believers and unbelievers alike see the foolishness of this. Um, but once again, it just shows that to reject God's revelation of himself in the scriptures leads to self-contradiction and ignorance. Furthermore, I'd like to add that the same people who claim that gender is not binary have failed to include all genders. Besides just showing how his prayer is illogical on a superficial level that doesn't even consult scripture, I also want to show the contrast between the first prayer of our Congress and the most recent. Because the first prayer stands on scripture and the second prayer uses scripture but does not stand on scripture, it betrays scripture and disagrees with scripture completely. And the main detriment of the second prayer is this, that Emmanuel Cleaver has absolutely no fear of God whatsoever. He has absolutely no reverence for God. And he cites scripture and then proceeds to damn himself by it because the very scripture that he's citing is judging him. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12 that the word of God is a double-edged sword and that it will <clears throat> judge the intentions of man's heart. And so if you're using the word of God in order to not worship God properly, it's going to be blaringly obvious because this is what all of scripture is, is it sheds light on untruth. For example, the scripture that he used at the end is the priestly blessing that God gave to Moses to give to Aaron, the first high priest, in order to bless the people of God, his nation, Israel, who he made a covenant with. Well, this is the passage from number six that he prayed from with a little bit before and after for context. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. So by blessing them, the sons of Aaron will put his name on the Israelites and then God will bless them. So Cleaver prays this prayer not to God who gave it, but to the self-described God and self-defined God that he cites at the end, and so he completely invalidates the prayer. This prayer in Numbers, as you can see, was intended for those who worship God truly, acknowledging him for who he is. It's a blessing that they should not stray from God. So it bears no meaning when somebody who has strayed from God prays it over themselves. The blessing actually has an underlying purpose, just like the rest of God's word is a double-edged sword. The underlying of this blessing is actually to judge and convict those who are not worshiping God in spirit and truth. Thus, it is both a blessing and a curse, depending on how the recipient actually deals with God as an individual. Although this prayer is constantly cited by believers and unbelievers really loosely as a general blessing, the implication is that if you do not worship God rightly, God will not bless you. God will not keep you. God will not make his face shine on you. God will not be gracious to you. 
God will not turn his face toward you, and God will not give you peace. He says, I will put my name on them and bless them at the end of the scripture. It says, so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. So to pray this prayer in the name of a self-made idol, like Cleaver has done, is to call all these curses upon yourself because you're not praying it by his name and his name is not on you. This man has no fear of God. How can anything that he does in Congress be marked by wisdom, which he prayed for earlier, when it has been inaugurated by this unwise prayer, which smears God's holy name and completely denies God <clears throat> under the guise of godliness? It cannot be. This is clearly what occurs when a nation rejects God. Romans 1, 22 through 28 address this, and I'm going to go over it because I believe that as we go over the scripture, you will see that this very thing, this rejection of God has occurred in our country and the consequences of that have manifested to where we can see that we've rejected God. This is Romans 1, 23 through 28. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So America has rejected God. Um, they've done this in countless ways, one of them being that they've become pluralist and sort of made up this mishmash of different gods and called that god, which is not god. Um, and, and then there are some people who are pantheists. They think that everything is god and they mistake god's creation for god and they start worshiping trees and butterflies and starting to, trying to hear voices from plants and spirits and that's what I was doing and when I was lost I was trying to hear from uh, spirits of plants and stuff like that. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So America has been given over to lust because they've rejected God and it says that they dishonor their bodies among themselves. Well, it's really clear to see that we've been given over to lust. I mean, it's nothing new. The billboards that dishonor young women and just everything has been so over-sexualized over that obviously we've just dealt with the devaluing of women, which women have tried to counteract with feminism, um, but that's still not hitting the deeper truth. And... Um, we could see with the porn industry that nobody has ever felt good about themselves after pleasuring themselves going on a pleasure spree to porn and that's something that you do in the darkness and you could see a high divorce rate um, nobody wants to follow the monogamous relationship that is God's design of marriage and because of that we have no peace um, we, we are just jumping around and corrupting ourselves and we just don't know how to stop for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So as you can see, once you're given over to lust and you start glorifying lust and following all your lustful de desires, it's only a matter of time before you're lust becomes even more corrupted by corrupting God's design of man and woman being together and you start to have homosexual desires and at this point we've reached a, a phase where not only many people struggle with homosexuality but then there's also another the voice of the world says that they should be proud of that and and as I've said it's just perpetual confusion like there's no escape from this confusion and it doesn't matter if you're confused about your gender and then you change it you're not going to become any less confused and in this state of perpetual turmoil because you're not you're not reconciled to God and that's the only way to have peace um, so as a nation we're sort of in this tumultuous state and it's all because God has given us over continually to deeper and deeper more and more corrupt lusts because we have not repented and turned to him and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So America has also been given over to a debased mind, which you could see in Emmanuel Cleaver's prayer in Congress. 
there's a lack of logic there and there's just so many people explaining themselves into self-contradicting circles because they have been given over to this debased mind which doesn't see the clear reality that that scripture reveals that God is sovereign and he's judging our nation because we've turned from him and loved our sin so very much more than him. As I've said, God has revealed himself plainly so that we are without excuse. He's revealed himself plainly in his creation and in our conscience. So if we look around and we see this miracle and this masterpiece around us of God's creation, the sun, moon, stars, sky, you know, trees, mountains, all the creatures of the earth, and deny that it was intelligently created and then we look to ourselves and how complex our inner lives are. I mean, that's a rejection of God. And it's a blatant rejection of God, no matter how you put it. And then there's the matter of conscience, which is that we, inside us, have God's law written on our hearts. We're fallen, so that's corrupted. But still, we have a sense of what's right and wrong. And morality and justice are important to us. And that should point us to an intelligent creator who values good and and hates evil, um, just like we have a righteous indignation when somebody has not been brought to justice yet, so does God, and he brings everything to perfect justice, and that's something that, like I've said, we need to have reverence and fear of God, and the Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. God obviously doesn't judge only nations, he judges individuals, and he calls all of us to repent and trust in Christ for our salvation. He holds us each accountable by all of these standards, the creation, the conscience, to so that, like I said, we're without excuse. And because we're without excuse, we ought to acknowledge, and like the prayer says, to throw ourselves on his gracious protection, that he has provided protection. God has provided a way back to himself, and it's not just for nations to take, it's for all of us as individuals to take, and we're all accountable to it, as I said, through the creation and through our conscience. We're all accountable to God, and he is just and holy, and he hates sin. And um, one way that I've heard it said that I like is that we aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And our fallen nature causes us to sin and to love sin and become enslaved by sin. And we're unable from that place to choose God because we just love our sin so much more. And the notion of a holy God who created us is something that we despise and curse. Um, but the Bible says that God displays his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And God himself, God the Son, humbled himself to a human existence and lived a life that was not glorious by any human standard so that he didn't stand out as the Messiah and as the king that everybody expected. But he lived the perfectly righteous life that none of us can, and he paid the price that um, we deserve to pay. The Bible says that the wages of our sin is death, and so we are paid for our sin in death. And then that death is not just a single event, and then we go into voidness. That death is an eternal death and an eternal separation and punishment from God by God. And... Um, that is what we are facing if we're relying on our own righteousness and leaning on our own works to justify us before God because God's standard is perfection and none of us can meet that, only he could. So what he did is that he did meet that standard by living a life none of us can. And then when he died and went to the cross, he died the death of a criminal even though he's the only spotless one among us. and. When that happened, God the Father um, poured his wrath on God the Son, and God himself took all of the wrath that we deserve onto himself. And in exchange, when we repent and trust in Christ and come to the foot of the cross and die to ourselves and ask for him to give us life, he regenerates us and he gives us his perfect life, it, that his perfect life is credited to our account and our sins are removed from us as far as the east is from the west so that even though we have committed countless crimes, we can stand before God blameless and be justified by God through Christ, by God's grace, through our faith in Christ.
we are saved. And that's the gospel. And the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And it also says that God sends out his word and it doesn't return back to him void. Everything that he sets it out to accomplish, it does accomplish. And so if today you're hearing this and you're feeling convicted um, and you're you're feeling convicted before the holiness of God and seeing who you are in light of who God is, how short you've fallen and how short we've all fallen, and you're grieving for your sin, be comforted because godly sorrow is different than worldly sorrow. The Bible says worldly sorrow leads to death, but godly sorrow leads to repentance and salvation. So I would just call you to repent and trust in Christ for your salvation, and then um, the justice that you deserve from God will be removed from you, and you'll experience God's grace, and you'll be at peace with God, and there's no peace outside of peace with God. So if you have any questions about what I've said, or you just want to speak more about what I'm talking about, please reach out to me in the comments, and um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. And thank you for listening to this video, and I hope everybody has a blessed rest of their day, rest of their week, and I just pray that they would be safe, uh, that y'all would be safe, that God would protect you. Um, but as we saw in this video, it's an empty and a vain prayer unless you repent yourself then the blessings of God will be upon you. And the greatest blessing of all is his salvation and to have eternal life in him. And so, um, God bless you all. Thank you.